Okay, hello everybody. My name is Anthony Blackburn. I'm the founder of Nebulous Group, a Web3 consulting firm. I'm also the senior event producer at SWE. Thank you guys for, for coming. Uh, today we have a panel on data availability. So I'll introduce my, my panelists now. Uh, first is Dr. Shriram Kanan, founder of Eigenlayer and director of the University of Washington Seattle Blockchain Research Lab. Hello, everybody. Give a round of applause for Sriram. So a little bit about Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer is a protocol built on Ethereum that introduces restaking, a new primitive in crypto economic security. This primitive enables the rehypothecation of ETH on the consensus layer. Users that stake ETH can opt into Eigenlayer smart contracts to restake their ETH and extend crypto economic security to additional applications on the network. Next, I have Nick White, the COO of Celestia Labs. Round of applause for Nick. <laughs> Celestia is a modular consensus and data network built to enable anyone to easily deploy their own blockchain with minimal overhead. Next, I have David Barreto, Starkware developer advocate. I give a round of applause for David. And Starkware develops StarkX, a permissioned layer two that uses validity proofs, and StarkNet, a permissionless valid validity rollup, sometimes referred to as a ZK rollup. And finally, we have Krati, the CEO, a CTO of Liberty Gaming. Please give a round of applause for Krati. And Liberty Gaming is an ecosystem that enables everyone, game developers, gamers, investors, games, brands, enthusiasts, to access and experience the very best of what's available in Web3 Gaming and the Metaverse. Okay, so before we begin, we're gonna do a little exercise to get everybody kind of loosened up, so if you guys could stand up for me. We're all just gonna put our hands up in the air, well, one hand up in the air, and please repeat after me. Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha ha. Ha 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 being themselves, emoting, so yeah, that's where it kind of came from. So I don't, there's not really a name for it. We can call it, I don't know, uh, the Anthony, the Anthony warm-up <laughs> for now. <laughs> okay, so let's dig in because we are on limited time. So uh, we're, today's conversation is about data availability. Data availability is a hot topic in the blockchain space at, the very, at this moment. And as we see Web3 adoption increasing and the astounding number of emerging use cases increase, the urgency to address the data, avail data availability conversation is at an all-time high. We're getting so popular, how are we gonna scale quickly and most importantly, securely? In this discussion, our incredible guests will dig into new approaches to tackling the data availability dilemma. So. Um, I'd like to uh, start with, uh, when we refer to data availability in blockchain, uh, what are we actually talking about and why do we need it? And so we'll actually start with, with Krati here. Okay. So um, when new blocks are produced on the blockchain, we need to ensure that data is complete, it's available, it's downloadable, and second, it is correct. It can be verified, and it can be used for further verifications. Now, at the level of L1s and at the level of L2s, this problem can be defined in different contexts. Uh, for example, if L1 layer, um, the data is not complete, then the other nodes will not be able to find out what is the correct data. And based on that, a lot of operations will be stopped. So the blockchain itself will stall. Correctness. So if the data is incorrect, or for, through some, some ways, invalid data got inserted in some of the blocks, we, we want to find it out. And we want to ensure that it does not result in stealing funds 
or any other kind of inconsistencies. And at the layer of L2s, because L2s are there to scale, we want to ensure that when we are achieving scale, we are not achieving it at the, at the cost of security. Because we want the scale data to still be correct. And hence, all the L2s, most of the L2s, still depend on L1s for data availability. So yeah, that's the short of it. Okay. Wow, thank you for that. Uh, does anybody have anything to, to add to I think that was a really great breakdown, actually. Uh, so we can actually jump into, OK, so why is data availability, data availability so important? Um, what could potentially go wrong if, uh, if the data isn't correct, it's not valid? Um, I'll leave the floor to you guys. Does anybody want to begin? I mean, I can talk about StarkNet, the implication. So StarkNet being a layer 2 and being a validity rollup, every time the layer 2, the state goes from state A to state B, we send this validity proof to layer one to verify the computation. But if we don't make the state B available to anyone to see, then not only people wouldn't be able to use their asset on, on layer two, it's just worst case scenario, you cannot transition from state B to state C. So the network will get pretty much stuck at that point. Sure, you wanted to? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, so one way to think about why do we need blockchains, right? Like let's go back to the very basics. We need blockchains, and why do we need decentralization in blockchains? And if you look at it, certain things like you know, uh, we, we just learned that you know, in a blockchain, you, when you're verifying a block, you're checking that the transactions are correct, right? And it turns out checking a transaction's correctness or the state correctness can be done really efficiently using cryptography, right? So that's what Starkware pioneers, for example. So when you're checking that uh, execution is correct or not, it is a mathematically verifiable fact. You can just check, you know, a piece of code, if you run on a certain input, what is the output that accrues to it? But whether the inputs to that computation, right, like when you're doing any kind of like a proof of correctness, there are inputs to the computation. And you want to make sure that either the inputs to the computation are available or the outputs of the computation are available. And how do we know objectively whether such uh, inputs to the computation or output to the computation, the data input or the data output, is actually available? Um, the way we do it in blockchains is by having a decentralized group of nodes bear testimony to this fact. OK. It's like. You know, one way to think about blockchains is you're actually freezing digital events in time, right? Like, so you have an ordering of digital events flowing in through the system, and you want to freeze them and, you know, later look at them so that you have a history recorded there. And data availability is one of those things which is not retroactively verifiable. Like, I come and I claim that yesterday, at this time, I had actually published the data. And you come in tomorrow and ask me, hey, did you, I, I, you say, no, you didn't publish the data yesterday. And you and I can keep arguing about this. And we see this a lot, right? And normally when you talk about history, there's always, you know, it's highly subjective and there is, you know, a lot of, you know, back and forth and he, sheds, he said, she said. And how do we solve this in blockchains? In blockchains, we solve this by actually having a decentralized quorum of nodes bear testimony to that fact. So in normal history, we use eyewitnesses, right? We, you know, you want to track what happened yesterday, use an eyewitness. And blockchains are basically decentralized eyewitness to the happening of certain events. And so that's why data availability is important. We'll come to efficiency, but maybe Nick wants to add something. Uh, yeah, I, I think I would, I, I agree with most of that, but I actually disagree that the way you solve data availability is by people bearing witness, um, like, that, that, that's if you're kind of assuming that people are not actually directly verifying the chain themselves. But to me, the whole point of blockchains is that they're verifiable ledgers. So like me as a user, I can actually verify for myself without trusting a committee of nodes uh, that, that this is true, that the state is correct, that the rules have been followed. And so that's why, uh, to me, um, the way that you verify data availability is by either one, downloading all the data yourself, 
to prove that yes, it is published because I have access to it and I can see directly that it's correct and everything else like that. Um, but the problem with that approach is that it's not scalable. So that's, that's kind of to me what the data availability problem is, is that if you want to increase the throughput of a blockchain, you end up increasing the amount of data that people have to verify as available. And that just means that you have to download more and more data. But me as an end user, I, I might only have a smartphone. I can't download you know, gigabytes of data. So the way that you solve that problem is with this technique called data availability sampling. So I can actually verify all the data in a, in a large block is available by downloading a very small subset of that data. And that way I don't have to rely on the nodes attesting that it's available. I actually know directly myself uh, through this uh, sort of cryptographic technique. Um, and so that to me is a data availability problem. How do you increase the block size but still preserve the ability for end users to verify it directly? Great. Thank you, guys. So OK, so you, you let me right into my next question. Uh, I think we've addressed the, the data availability problem. Uh, so what are your thoughts on, on steps forward? How, how, how might we be able to solve this, this scaling problem? And what are the implications in terms of speed and security that might, be, might need to be taken into account? Uh, in the case, again, of Starknet, of course, we're looking forward to EIP 4844 as a new way to you know, post data uh, on chain at a much lower price. Because today, when we compare the, the price of a layer 2 transaction, 95% of the cost comes from the just sending data to layer 1 for data availability. Uh, only the remaining 5% is just sending the proof and the verification. Uh, so if with EIP 4844, really it reduces drastically the cost of a storage, or at least posting data, uh, it will have a significant impact on the cost of layer two transactions. We're also looking into an, a different data availability mode for a startup called Volition, where basically the user gets the option to choose if they want to store data on chain or off chain. And it's, it's like a seamless transition. You can have in the same smart contract some data store on chain, some off chain. So basically, you, just, you decide how much you want to pay based on where you want to store data. So we have two, those two main approaches in the short term. And of course, long term, we're exploring different solutions, one of them actually being Celestia as well. But uh, for now, short term is uh, Volition and EIP4844. Thank you. What do you guys think? Uh, I can add something on the scaling problem. So when we talk about scaling, we have to look at what, the, what we are scaling. And uh, if you look at it, basically, you, you have each node has, I would say, four fundamental resources. You have computational resources, like how much like, you can execute. You have RAM, right? how much memory you have on random access. You have networking, like how much bandwidth do you have. And then you have uh, storage, long-term storage. Could be you know, hard disk, magnetic, whatever. And one of the core realizations that the uh, broader Ethereum research community came, came to like several years back is that by separating what is happening, uh, by separating these four different types of resources, how they are handled, you can actually achieve very high scaling. And what do I mean by that? Um, the whole paradigm of, say, layer two rollups is the idea that you can actually uh, offload computation and memory outside the network because a single node or like some group of nodes actually do the computation and memory management off-chain and are able to prove to the consensus nodes that that has actually happened correctly. And since it's a cryptographic proof that anybody can verify really easily, so you are basically scaling computation and memory in this way. So this is part of the modular layer two type architecture that Ethereum pivoted towards. And if you look at the remaining resources, there is network bandwidth, and then there is uh, storage. First, I'll handle the easy one, the storage. It, so one, one, one thing people can get confused when we talk about data availability is it's, we are not talking about long-term data availability. And for example, you know, there is an NFT, and like, I publish the NFT, and like two months later, I want to have, or like two years later, I want to retrieve the NFT. Uh, this is 
uh, called the archival storage problem. And the archival storage problem is, does not have a security bottleneck because anybody, if they had the data, even if just one node had the data, they can always uh, prove that they have the right data relative to the ledger because on the ledger you record the hash of that data. So the long-term storage is also actually easy. So finally, the only scaling bottleneck left in when we talk about scaling of blockchains is network bandwidth. So when we are talking about like the data availability problem, fundamentally we are talking about how to scale network bandwidth. And because the other resources have been taken care of in this manner. And so the question is, uh, at least the way we think about this question is if you have n nodes in a blockchain, each of them have a certain amount of network bandwidth, what is the rate at which you can run the entire system? Okay, so just to put these numbers in some context, in Ethereum, e a node requirement, the node bandwidth requirement for each node is something like two megabytes per second. So that's the node bandwidth requirement. And how many nodes are there, depending on how you count it, there are 500,000 validators or maybe 8,000 independent nodes. So you have a lot of nodes, right? Each node has like two megabytes per second bandwidth. And you can ask how, fast is the system running, which means I take the Ethereum blockchain, the only thing I do on the Ethereum blockchain is to just publish data. That's all I do. Then you ask, what is the rate at which you're able to publish data to Ethereum? You don't do any computation, no Uniswap, nothing, just use, Starkware comes and buys off the entire block space, just writing data to Ethereum. What is the rate at which you can do it? On Ethereum today, that's 83 kilobytes per second. So you have 83 kilobytes per second is the rate at which you can write data into the system. Each node in the system has like two, needs two megabytes per second, and there are like tens of thousands of nodes. So the scaling to me is basically, can we somehow not be limited to such a small number in the throughput? Can we somehow have the net system throughput increase linearly with the number of nodes in the system. For example, at 10,000 nodes and two megabytes per second, if you multiply the two things, we're talking about like in the high tens of gigabytes per second. That is the theoretical limit for where we could be. And a scalable data availability system would deliver us that. So that's our view of what we think and where we think scaling plays. One of the uh, quotes from Vitalik on this is like, we know how to build a blockchain which has a non-scalable execution and scalable data availability. And basically, uh, the layer two rollups offload the, um, scalable, uh, sc the execution so that you don't have to face it on the blockchain. And the only thing that the blockchain needs to do is to scale the data availability. So that's our. This is why these guys are our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Without them, we would be, we'd be waiting about a week to get one transaction done. <laughs> so thank you guys. Um, we're running low on time, so I think we're just gonna wrap this up with some final thoughts. So uh, hold on one second. So we can go longer. Wait, we can go longer? Okay, we'll go longer until we get kicked off the stage. <laughs> okay, so uh, does anybody want to actually piggyback off what, what Sriram just said? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll add something. I, um, I agree with Sriram that um, the property that we want our blockchains, our data availability layers to have is that the more nodes there are in the network, the more bandwidth the overall network has. Like that's, without that, uh, they won't scale. Right? And, and actually, traditional monolithic blockchains don't have that property. You can add as many nodes as you want. You have a fixed block size. Um, and so that's really important. And, and so far, only data availability sampling is able to achieve that. Uh, it looks like we have run out of time. My last thing is that scalability, though I define differently than like scaling, scalability we define at Celestia as the amount of transactions you can verify divided by the cost to verify those transactions. So if you, and that's why monolithic blockchains don't scale. You can increase the block size, but you need a bigger node to verify them. And in a data availability sampling world, you can increase the block size by, and the cost to verify that block only increases as the square root of the block size. So like it's not perfectly flat, but it is sublinear, which is really, really important and like the key to all of this. 
Thank you, Nick. Uh, really sorry, guys. We, we're we're going to have to cut this short. We're out of time. But uh, I hope that this panel was, was insightful to everybody as an intro to data availability for those who don't know uh, much about it. Thank you so much, guys. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll end it off with just any final thoughts um, from you guys and also um, a little plug on, on all of your projects just so that everybody knows how to find you. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it to Krati. I think I'll go first because in the last question, I wanted to say a couple of things when you asked that uh, uh, scalability versus speed. And you know, when I look at all the projects that we are building here in ETH Denver and all the Ethereum conferences, they come to the same crux of the problem, which is um, you want scale, you want security, you want decentralization. And um, you, as part of scale, you want speed. And that speed is important for DeFi projects, that's important for gaming projects. I mean, I am working on a gaming SDK where game developers can use our Unity SDK and build smart contract wallets, um, omni-chain and NFT marketplaces. But then at the end of the day, if it takes 10 seconds to confirm a transaction, no one is going to play those games. Hence, we need to solve scale at every level. At the layer, at the layer one blockchain, uh, we want to solve it. At the le le uh, level two, uh, the layer two blockchains, whether they are optimistic rollups or they are uh, ZK-based rollups. And again, the problem there of data availability also breaks down into two different parts, where both the optimistic rollups and ZK-based rollups, they submit some kind of proof to the layer one that, hey, these transactions were done and they are all valid transactions. So to, to prove that we, as well. We might have to wrap up. I'll cut it. OK, I'll cut it. So basically everything that we are building is going to be around the same data availability problem. Yeah, it affects all of us. OK. Uh, sorry, we're getting kicked off stage, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you. If thank you guys so have any questions, these guys will be over here as well.